Hello there YouTubers and welcome to another equipment autopsy. Today we're doing this not in the workshop, we're doing this in the new place. As you can see I have my dining table covered up with newspapers to protect that so that we can get a bit messy on top of it. What we have right here is something that I found in the junk room and what it is, well it's a record player, no doubt about that. It is the HGS Electronic Party Stereo. This is a rather cute little thing. It's a uh, hideously cheap record player, as you can no doubt see. Uh, tone arm. It's all, well, as you can see, that is all cracked apart, but you can see it's nothing special. Never has been anything special. That's probably a crystal cartridge. I don't think that would be a magnetic one. It does have, aside from the record player, the amplifier built in. Now this is not one of these portable things that would have uh, speakers that uh, clip on top of it or anything to kind of form a case. This is intended to be used in homes. It's not a portable at all. Um, on the back we have, as you can see, speaker jacks, DIN jacks, as well as a DIN jack for a tape deck. I'm not sure if this would be a record output as well as an input. I guess it would only be an input, but I don't know. Maybe it's just a record output. It doesn't have a, uh, a selector on here for an external input. Uh, what we do have is a balance left right. We have bass, treble, and volume. Some uh, rather cheap slider controls, which probably are terribly dirty. And then up here, up front, we have speed selector 33, 45. We have a mysterious start button does not lock in or anything. Uh, I don't think this would be any sort of fully automatic thing, so we'll have to find out what start means. Then we have this incredibly clunky, massive sounding power button. I mean, just, just listen. That certainly doesn't sound like something that would belong into a cheap thing like this. Now, uh, the interesting bit is, this is not the first time I've run across one of these. Now, um, my grand-aunt, who previously, before she died, used to live in the other house, where I now have my workshop, she had an HGS party stereo too. Now, the unit was long gone when I was around, but uh, when we uh, pulled the house apart after her death, uh, we found the instruction manual, which also included a schematic. So I can already say we are going to find an integrated amplifier, an integrated circuit amplifier in this, and you're not supposed to short out the speaker terminals. I can still remember that. There was a huge warning in the uh, in the manual that uh, shorting out the speakers would damage the amplifier. Another interesting thing is this is not made in Japan or made in China or uh, made in Germany or anything. Uh, this is another one of these uh, pieces of equipment made in Eastern Europe. So for being so incredibly cheap, uh, quality-wise, build quality-wise, it's actually quite good. I mean, this up here, this chassis, that is not plastic. That is metal, believe it or not. You can probably see it. It's a bit of a shiny part right there. The color is worn off. Uh, this would have come with a uh, with a smoke glass lid to cover up the whole thing, but that was already smashed up and cracked whenever I found it, so I didn't bother taking it with me. Um, and, well, since this is all messed up and broken, we can just go straight ahead and mercilessly take this thing apart. Not before taking a look at the bottom. You can clearly see this was made in Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm not sure if that is Polish or, or what that is, but it's definitely an Eastern European language right there. Another giveaway, instead of uh, rating the power consumption in watts, they used volt pairs. Let's go ahead and uh, open up this thing. Let's see. Oh, 
So you can see it does actually, wait a minute, is that a battery compartment? No, it's just a, uh, a storage compartment for the power cord. So it is somewhat portable. Made in 1980, I guess, 80.11, so maybe November 1980. This definitely is an interesting construction. Removing a C-clip enables you to take off the plastic platter. What it reveals is a sub platter, which is something that you normally find on high-end belt drive record players. That was kind of a surprise. You take off that thing as well without problems. Uh, flat belt running the whole thing. The motor is, uh, it may look that way, but it's not mounted in any sort of uh, shock absorbing uh, construction. It's just solid in there. Uh, and here is proof that this was in fact made in Poland. Unitra is a Polish company, or was a Polish company. And as you can see, I got the unit open up. This is the top half, that's the bottom half, with the transformer in it, as well as a mains fuse right there, and the jacks. I gotta say, I am surprised. I am impressed. I mean, this uh, Eastern European stuff, uh, for the price, was always much, much better. Uh, quality-wise than the typical kind of Japanese stuff, typical kind of budget-priced Japanese equipment. I mean, look at this. Um, we have right here the power supply, which comes with some pretty big filter capacitors, as well as a 5.6-volt Zener diode right there. We also do have a little bit of uh, logic on there. Um, I'm not sure if this would have been some sort of uh, TTL uh, chip. The In Eastern Europe they had different numbers for uh, for chips. The same chips that also existed in the West, they just had different uh, names on there. This uh, is uh, This also controls the motor. Now, as it turns out, the start button would probably start up the motor turning. Uh, there is no kind of classic contact that you activate by pulling the tone arm over onto the record. Uh, you know, with a lot of record players that's kind of coupled. If you uh, bring out the tone arm, it starts up the motor. Uh, on this one, you have to do it with this uh, with the start button. And as you can see, it uh, indeed is not automatic. It's just an electrical contact right there, just a, uh, a single switch. Speed selector also is a uh, rather simple thing. They just uh, <laughs> there's really just one electric button, but uh, on the outside they make it look like two buttons. Massive power switch right there, of course. Um, now, so you turn on the motor with the start button, and the electronic then turns the motor off again automatically does have automatic shutoff, and I do find it quite remarkable how that was done. You can already see it. Now, the arm is already broken off, but uh, as you can see, what happens is, as the arm moves across the record, gets closer to the center, this interesting structure right there gets into there, and that's of course an optical sensor. We have the light source up on top and uh, looking at the thing I guess it's really just a uh, an ordinary light bulb and then we have this photo cell quite a giant photo cell down there as the tone arm comes closer blocks more and more light and eventually it uh, blocks it all the way and then the motor would just shut off that is a very interesting setup and here we have the underside all taken apart. There is the power supply module we've already seen. Zener diode with heat sink. Very old way of mounting those things. Uh, however, what I wanted to point out are these. These are, well, they almost look like surface mount devices right there. These tiny little diodes. There are two of them. I thought that was kind of interesting how they did that. Um, 
And then here we have the amplifier, and remember what I said, you're not supposed to short out the speakers. Never, ever. Well, the previous owners did manage to do that, because as we look at those uh, chips, this is the original Eastern European made UA type um, chip, or uh, what was it? UL it was. UL something, you can't really read the number anymore. That's original, however, on this one you can see it's a uh, TBA, and that is the Western equivalent for that chip, or vice versa, whatever. Uh, the TBA is definitely a Western made one, so I guess what happened was the previous owners managed to blow up this channel and had the whole thing repaired in a workshop, and of course they only uh, had the uh, the Western part to put in as a replacement. Uh, certainly not a very good chip amplifier. You can see the speaker output capacitors right there. Technically, it's not ideal. The uh, preamplifier was with with the tone controls, as you can see. Uh, it's almost all passive. They do actually have two transistors in there. This is the input, and uh, this definitely was a crystal cartridge. Uh, the levels had to be quite high because they were actually feeding those into a switched DIN jack. This is where the uh, tone arm would have hooked up. And as you can see, that soldered straight onto the DIN jack. And if you plugged in a wire into that, the, uh, the DIN jack would then switch to, uh, to that wire. And that is where the amplifier part is hooked up. So it is, in fact, a DIN input. And um, uh, from what I can tell, it is not at all an output. Nope. No output, no record output on that one. Uh, here we have the, uh, the photo cell thingy. You can see this pattern on there. So the light would... Uh, just slowly fade out as this uh, got in between the uh, light bulb. It is indeed a light bulb in there. And there is the photo cell. So that's that's how they did that. Even got some uh, some shielding going on, some uh, aluminum coated paper right there to uh, shield the back of that circuit board. Eh, I really gotta say, this was cheap equipment. This did not cost a whole lot. However, as you can clearly see, it sure is pretty good quality and it does have quite a few good ideas in there. So, there you have it. The HGS Party Stereo really made by Unitra in Poland in 1980. Thank you for watching.